34.4, I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears. Well, this is part two of our series, I Was Afraid of That. And we're putting an emphasis on the was, because that's past tense, because we have a God who delivers us from our fears. So we may have fears in our life now, but we're thinking of the delivery from bondage and saying, I was afraid of that. And it's much more than just a sermon series. We would like for this to be a time in the history of our church where God really works on us with our fear because we're living in a culture of really inflated fear. So I had the privilege last night of being a part of a home gathering in Connect Goose Bay area. If you want to be a part of that home gathering next week, hey, check it out on our calendar online. Calendar looks real good, by the way, for those who've been working on that. You can contact those and come out. What we did last night is we just went through part one. The study, the presentation I had here last week, we just went through that and talked about it in a living room and prayed for one another, and we're going to do that the next four weeks. So you can do the same thing. You could come join us for that, have your own, or you could come back today after you go home and eat lunch. Three o'clock, we're going to be right back here for some afternoon sessions, and we'll enjoy some presentations, and we're going to hear from Dr. Oliver and also Keone Oliver, um, both today, and then we're going to have a time after we break from that, we're going to sit around some tables, and we're just going to talk about fear in our culture, fear in our lives, things you disagreed with from the sermon, all that stuff. So you can come out at 3, three o'clock and then 4 o'clock for the discussion. If you're watching online and you can't make it in, there is one discussion group that starts at 4 on Zoom. So you can go to the website, go to the information page, and you can join that discussion. All of that because I think it's so important that we just talk about these things rather than going home and letting them just speak to us all the time and we just build all these anxieties we can be a community that helps one another through this stuff so this is one part of it hope you come out for that and yesterday not yesterday last sabbath we started with the fear paradox and i am suggesting that an appropriate fear of god conquers our fear of everything else. I hope that that truth meant something to you this week as you went through life and thought about God and your fear. And next week, we're going to be talking about fear of religious persecution. Then we're going to be talking about fear of loss and fear of not being enough when we have overpowering oppression in our life and we're not big enough for it. Today, we're talking about fear of the future. I was afraid of the future. So let's pray as we get into the message. God, we thank you for a future and a hope that you are entirely in control of. You're not stressed about the future. and We trust you in that because we are. We have a lot of things we see in the future that terrify us. And we choose today to listen to the voice of truth that you're a good God who's going to lead us in all the scary stuff we see. I pray you'd speak through your word today. Make this more than just me talking and, and people listening to me. Make this an appointment with you. Take us out of bondage and into the good things you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may know the man named Nick Walinda. Maybe you've seen him on TV. He's a daredevil. He knows something about fear. For seven generations, his family has been performing daring acts before the public. They started in the 1780s. That's how long the, the Walinda family has been doing daring things. They brought their acts to the circus in America. And Nick has been walking on a, on a wire since he was 18 months old. I don't know when he learned how to walk, but he learned how to walk on a wire when he was 18 months old. And since then, his wire walking, he's gotten higher, high wire walking, has taken him across the Grand Canyon, has taken him over Times Square between two towers in Chicago blindfolded and across Niagara Falls. And he's had wind gusts of like 50 miles an hour and had to stay on this wire. Nick is fearless. And he married a daredevil. So his wife actually broke his record. 
he had a record for the iron jaw hang. That's a pretty cool record. So in that record, his wife broke that record when she held on by her teeth to a cable that was attached to a helicopter while it was flying over Niagara Falls. And as it turns out, all this daredevil stuff is dangerous. So the Walinda family has actually, in their two and a half centuries of daredevil stunts, they've actually experienced some tragedy. And one of those tragedies is particularly tied with Nick's story. In 1962, some of his family, seven members of the Walinda family, were performing at the Shrine Circus in Detroit, and they're performing a seven-person pyramid. So you just have to visualize this. I mean, you got people on the, on the base of the pyramid, and then you have a pole on their shoulder, and you have people standing on that pole, and then you have a pole on their shoulder and people standing on that pole. So they're, they're standing in a seven-person pyramid, and that seven-person pyramid is walking on a high wire without a safety net. And so this one, they've done did this many times, but this time in 1962, the pyramid fell. And two of Nick's uncles were killed, and one was paralyzed. Decades later, Nick had the opportunity to join six other Walendas and reenact that act. So the one that ended in tragedy, they get the opportunity, he gets the call, and one of his uncles says, hey, do you want to come do a seven-person pyramid with us? And he says, yes, I want to do a seven-person pyramid. So at that time, his parents had actually told him that he needed to get a real job. Not because they were afraid, not, not just like, oh, we think you're going to get hurt. Fear didn't factor into this at all. It's just that his parents believed, after all those generations, they believed that the circus had no future, and so he needed to do something else. He could still enjoy this, but it had no future. And then he went to the seven-person pyramid, and when he arrived, wherever it was they were doing it, he saw the streets just lined with vans and people with video cameras, and as he experienced all this, he realized the circus was not dead. It had just changed. So Nick, seeing all that, dropped out of medical school and continued to pursue his passion and his legacy of full-time walking on high wires. Nick is fearless. At least he thought he was until he experienced his own tragedy in 2017. So the same act, the seven-person pyramid, which has been known as the most dangerous act in the history of circus, he was doing, except for they were now doing an eight-person pyramid. And in one of their practices, it wasn't a performance, but in one of their practices, Nick's eight-person pyramid fell. And Nick was one of the three who grabbed the wire. The other fell 30 feet to the ground. No one lost their lives. They all survived this one. But they're rushed to the hospital, and the emergency room didn't look like a very good future. It looked pretty stressful. Nick's sister was unconscious. She broke every bone in her face. I don't know how many bones you have in your face, but she broke every one. And she broke her arm and her leg. And Nick, who was not hurt, told the reporters, he said, it's terrible, it's tragic, it's a nightmare. And then he said, but the Walindas will get through it. That's what we've always done, and that's what we're going to do. But the truth is that Nick really struggled to get through it. He ended up like, locking himself in a room for a week, just like thinking about life. He had PTSD. Every time he thought about the wire, he just imagined it falling. And the daredevil, who had 250 years of family history, seven generations, and a family motto that people knew of never give up, he was, he was really seriously considering walking away from all of that. And this man had walked out onto a wire without a safety net and walked across the Grand Canyon. He had done such courageous things, and now he thought about those things that at once he was excited about that future. He dropped out of medical for school for that future. He was looking forward to those things, and now they terrified him. What happened? Well, the daredevil was paralyzed. And not physically, he was crippled in his fear. Fear is crippling. When it wins, we stop moving forward. And fear is winning in our culture. That's that's how it is. Fear is winning in our culture, and we are not immune. 
And in Numbers 13 and 14, we find a story of God's people going into an incredibly good future and fear crippling them. And we are reminded in this story that God has awesome things, but if we let fear get a hold of us, we stop moving into those awesome things. And there's a reason why it's not okay. It's not okay for us to be crippled in our fear, and it's because there is so much good in the future you're afraid of. I'm going to put that on the screen. I hope you remember that. That's the point of the sermon today. I hope that this message right here, there's so much good in the future you're afraid of, I hope it's one of those things that God could plant on your heart right now, because I believe it's true, and that you would remember it 10 years from now when you're afraid. That you'd be able to tell yourself, oh yes, there is so much good in the future I'm afraid of. Let God speak this truth to you because it's, it's solid. There is good in your future. So open to Numbers 13 and 14. That's our text. There's two chapters. That's where we're going to be today, and you're going to want to have that in front of you. Numbers 13 and 14. The people there did not, did not heed any of the vi- advice I'm going to give today. <laughs> They ended up spiraling into fear. But we learned something from their story. I want you to notice the beginning of the report and the result of the report. So they had spies that went out to see the promised land, and ten of them came back uh, with a bad report. And they started sharing the report. And in Numbers 13, 27, just notice the change. Notice how fear changes everything. Verse 27, it says, They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. That's a good report. Hey, we went into that land. It's as good as we ever thought it was. Here's some of the fruit. Then they continue to tell the report. And at the end, chapter 14, verse 1, that night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Uh, you got to ask, what happened in that report? It started with the excellent news. We went and spied it out, and it's good. And then after the report, they stay up all night crying. So what happened in that report is that they saw the future, and they saw more fear than they saw good. There was good in their future, but they saw so much fear that they listened to that, and by the end, they were overwhelmed and they were crippled in their fear, and they just had an emotional breakdown, and they started crying. We're going to look at what they didn't do and what we could do different. See, there's so much good in the future you're afraid of, but these people missed it, and we don't have to. So we're going to give three actions. Three actions, none of them which were taken by the Israelites in Numbers 13 and 14. And these three actions are actions that will move you beyond your faith into the good future God has for you because there is so much good in the future God has for you. And action number one is listen to both sides of the story. You guys know this. If you're a parent, you know there's always two sides to a story. Maybe more. But there's at least two sides to every story. And when you hear the first one, it sounds pretty good. And then you hear the second one, and you're like, oh, now I see. So listen to both sides of the story. The Israelites did that because it started with a good report and then then they shared the bad. But what happened with the Israelites is they listened until all they saw was the report of fear. Every one of us in our lives have a report from the ten and from the two. We're hearing the report of fear and we're hearing the report of faith. And if we only listen to the report of faith or if we listen to it, the majority of the report of fear is what we listen to, pretty soon we stop hearing the good side of the story. Next time fear gives you a report, like that phone call you're going to get from your daughter or that headline you're going to see on your phone when you pull it up when the pastor starts getting kind of boring, whatever report fear has for you, when you see that report and you start getting excited, here's what you could do. Tell yourself this. There's two sides to every story. Yeah, that that one gets me scared. But there's two sides to every story, and God has another side for me to listen to. I want to start with the bad side of the story. There was some truth in the bad news. There is. That's why we listen to both sides of the story. It's helpful to be grounded in reality and realize there's some people in that land. You know, they spied out the land, and they saw fortified cities. They saw inhabited land. They saw strong people. 
It was good for them when they crossed that Jordan to, to not think that it was just barren land, like they wanted to be prepared. So we need to listen to that side, but oh, that side can be overwhelming. Just think of what the bad news report is telling us in our world today. We, have, we are overwhelmed with headlines. We live in a scary world. So we got health issues and economy issues. We got religious freedom issues. All these things bombarding us. And so we're going to jump into that. Don't get depressed because there is so much good in the future you're afraid of. But when you look at the future, you see things like the, man, over 100 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. And if you're not afraid of that, I mean, just think about the fact that now there's mutations, all right? There's all these things coming, and what it feels like is that there's a bad thing, and we just get halfway adjusted to that, and then life hits us with another bad thing, and we're just in fear saying, what's next? I heard about a comic illustration. I'll try to describe it. So imagine you're in space, and you're looking at the earth, and the earth is overwhelmed with all these bad things. There's fires. There are, uh, you know, contentious elections and all these things. And to your left is an alien, and to your right is an asteroid. And they look at each other, and they're looking at earth, and they just say, who's next? And that's how it feels. It feels like, okay, what's coming next? Because if I'm predicting the future by what, what has happened in the past year, it just feels like we're going to get hit with something even worse. And we have... Meanwhile, the whole earth going crazy and people are telling us, if we don't do something different, we're going to destroy our planet, right? Depends on which one you believe, but here's the fear messaging going on. Look at those glaciers receding. Look at the honeybees dying. Everything's going to go crazy by the year 2025. We're all going to go extinct. And we hear all these messaging of fear. And if you don't get afraid by watching public news, I mean, just talk to the people you know. I do that. I talk to you. And it's amazing to me the scary things you're dealing with. Like really, truly hard, difficult things. If you're not feeling fear in your own life, call up a few people that you know and you'll find that people you know right now are crippled in fear by a diagnosis. People you know right now have issues with their children that are overwhelming them. People you know right now have no idea what they're going to do for employment. And they're experiencing fear in a way that's it's literally paralyzing them in a place in their life. And these aren't just people on the news. These are people we know. And then the fear report goes further. Oh, the devil's so, so sneaky. You realize that there's some unique fears to Christians. If we're not careful, the good news and the truth we know about the end of the world can become stressful stuff. You guys know Jesus is coming back? Isn't that good news? But if we're not careful, all this good news becomes like, oh boy, there's a, there's a great time of trouble coming. How am I going to take care of my kids? When is the close of probation? And, you know, is COVID-19 one of those plagues? And where's the mark of the beast? And we're, we're looking at all these things that should be good news for us, like Jesus is coming back. And we Christians get our own Christian fears, like, Will I really be able to be strong enough in persecution? And that's why Jesus keeps saying, here's the patience of the saints. Just keep the commandments of God. Have the faith of Jesus. Just stay in love with me. And you don't have to really worry about if you'll be enough. Just stay in love with me. So that's the bad news report. Uh, it's a real report. Listen to both sides of the story. You listen to that side and you say, okay, there's some bad news. There's some scary stuff in the future. And then you say, uh, but there's another side of the story. You want to hear the other side of the story? In this chapter, there was such good stuff in the future they're afraid of. Not only were there like watermelon-sized grapes and exciting things, but go back to chapter 13, verse 1. Notice the optimistic, positive tone this whole thing starts with. It, you know, 14, verse 1, they're crying. 13, verse 1, there's a good future. And notice this, it's God who invites them into it. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Now, whose idea was that? The Lord said to Moses. So right now, that future you're afraid of, it's God who's inviting you into it. And remember, that's the God who knows the end from the beginning. That's the God who sees all things. And you might not see it, but he actually sees good in the future you're afraid of. And he, in his wisdom, is saying, hey, 
Move into that future. Let's go and send out spies. It's time to move forward. It's God's idea. It wasn't a crazy idea of Moses. It was God's idea. And I want to just try to describe to you the optimism for the future that they should have felt in Numbers 13. A year ago, they were slaves in Egypt. They were looking at a future that seemed really dark and helpless. Like, here's a pharaoh that's more powerful than us, and, you know, we're really probably not going to get out. We've been here 400 years. But some of those slaves making bricks in Egypt remembered a promise, because there was a promise given to their ancestor Abraham. Abram was called to a land in Genesis 12, and then in Genesis 15, God said to Abram, it's amazing. You can read it in Genesis 15. He says, your descendants will be slaves in a different land for 400 years. Then he made a promise, but I will bring them back to this land and I will give them this land as an inheritance. So the promise was a land. God said, I'm going to do this, and then it happened. They were slaves 400 years. So there was some slaves in Egypt making bricks who said, there's a land God's promised us. And then there's some other slaves in Egypt who were, you know, not listening to both sides of the story. And they said, yeah, we've been here 400 years. You really think God remembers that land? How are we going to get out of here? And then, in the craziest year of their lives, God works mirac- miracle after miracle. He brings plagues, and he, he changes Pharaoh's heart, and then Pharaoh calls them back, and they come out of Egypt, and they march across the sea as God parts it, and they see it come back together, and they see the armies of Egypt drown, and then they spend that time camped at Sinai where God instructs them on how to live well. They, he's re-educating the slaves from the mindset of bondage to the mindset of freedom, and he says, here's the path, walk in it. And then finally, after all those years, they're stand, they've, they've left Sinai, and they're standing on the edge of the promised land, and God is saying, hey, now it's time, guys. Now it's time for you to walk into the promise. If you were a Hebrew, Numbers 13, verse 1 would have been, such an exciting moment, not just of your life, but of your national history. God has led us finally to the place where we're ready to send spies to go look at the land, the one we dreamed about and never quite realized would actually happen, our faith wavered. Now we're at a point where we're actually, actually entering the good things God has for us. This is like the ancient Hebrew equivalent to the generation that gets to see Jesus come back. This is an exciting time. This is This is the fulfillment of the promise we've all been waiting for. So, they should have gone into Numbers 13 thinking, oh man, there is so much good in this future we're afraid of. Like, God is fulfilling his promise. So he brought him into the desert, but he had something better than that. The desert wasn't the destination. You guys realize that? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23, he says, God brought us out that he might bring us in into the land he promised. So the desert was a good thing. God used the desert, but the desert wasn't the destination. God's future for you is not just about bringing you out of your bondage. That's a good thing. God has something, don't miss this, God has something better than just bringing you out of bondage. He has a vibrant life that he's designed to bring you into. And the trouble is, some of us have become comfortable in the desert. We, we look back at what God's brought us from and we're like, Whew, I'm not that angry person anymore. Praise God, I'll just sit here in my desert and not look forward to the good God has for me. I'm not that intoxicated person anymore. I'll just sit here in my desert. But the desert is not God's destination for you. He actually has something good to bring you into. Can you imagine when you look back at all the ways God's delivered you from bondage, Can you imagine that that God, who's powerful to bring you out, actually has custom-designed a beautiful future that he longs to bring you into? He says it's a land flowing with milk and honey. You know what that means? That means that there's abundance of goodness in this land. The desert's not flowing with anything. And some of us in our Christian experience think God has worked a great work and we're content with that work just to be out of Egypt just to be better than we were before. And God's saying, no, actually, I have so much good. Not just uh, limiting of bad. I have so much good if you would walk into the promise I have for you. And so we find ourselves in the desert and we get to make some decisions. 
And what God is telling us in this story is, hey, just listen to both sides of the story. Yes, there's bad. Hey, what is next? You know, that alien in the asteroid. What is next? Uh, I'm predicting from Scripture in our experience that whatever's next is probably something really bad. Probably something really uncomfortable. But you know what else? I know for sure that whatever's next, God's goodness is there. God's hope is there. God's presence is there. And so, yeah, tomorrow and the next week, until, we, until Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory, there's going to be some scary stuff in your future. There's going to be some phone calls that are devastating. But I guarantee you, God's goodness is in our future. He has promises, and he keeps his promises. So listen to both sides of the story. That's an action you can take. When fear gives us a report, and you start getting filled with anxiety, calm down, take a breath, and say, there's another side to this story and let God speak to you the side of the goodness, the so much good God has in your future. And they keep going. We're going to read the report, piece of the report. And we're going to see action number two is give the good news more airtime than the bad news. Here's what happens. Once we've heard both sides of the story, we get to choose which one we keep listening to. And every single one of us, at least right now, is still in control of what media comes into our brain and our lives. We can turn the radio on or off. We can click the site or not click the site. We can choose which stuff comes in. And as people who want to live in hope for the future and not crippled by fear, here's what we need to do. We need to give the good news more airtime than the bad news. When we give the bad news equal or more airtime than the good news, that's when we get crippled. And we stop remembering that there is any good news to listen to. So you choose which messages you take. And some of them are scary, and you just have to look at those and say, yeah, that's, that's a scary reality. But then make sure you have some input and some channels coming into your life emphasizing the good news. Watch what happens when you give more airtime to the bad news. Here's how the report goes. First, we see that it overemphasizes the bad news. I'm just going to cite a few things. If you have it open to Numbers 13, notice in 28, verse 28, the bad news says there are strong people. Then skip down and notice verse 31. It moves a level up. It went from saying they were strong to now saying they are stronger than we are. Do you notice what the fear report is doing? It's intensifying. And then it starts exaggerating. Verse 31 moves on from them being strong to stronger to them saying portrayed as giants who devour people. So if we listen to the fear report, if we give that report all the airtime in our brain, we're going to see things that are strong and then we're going to say, oh, they're not just strong. They're stronger than we are. They're not just stronger than we are. They're giants and they're going to devour me. Fear overemphasizes the bad news. That's what fear will do. And so if we let that have more airtime, pretty soon we're going to start rewriting the story from scary realities to fiction that we've made up in our own mind that terrifies us and cripples us. And some of us are doing that. We're listening to this, the scary stuff and it's just getting worse. And then as we listen, not only does it overemphasize the bad news, it starts adopting, adopting a scarcity mentality. You know the scarcity mentality. There's just not enough room on the top. There's not enough. Here, Listen to that. So verse... 29, they're looking at this, uh, what they saw, and they report this. The Amalekites live in the Negev. That's the desert. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. They come back with the report that says, hey, there's good news, but there's all the good land's taken. You want a spot on the sea? The Canaanites are there. You want a spot in the hills? You've got to fight them. All the good stuff is taken, and fear adopts a scarcity mentality. And what it's telling you right now is there's no more good spouses out there. There's no more good jobs. There's no more good opportunities. No more good lives to live. They're all taken up. Afraid of a lot of things. But never fear that God has run out of resources. All right. We're talking about a God who made everything out of nothing. And then we're going to let fear tell us that there's no more good things that he has for us. There's no more blessing. Like he used it all up on past generations and now he's calling you into a future and he's like, oh man, 
I brought you here and I don't have any more good stuff to give you. But fear adopts a scarcity mentality that says, you know, you're going to run out of time. You're going to run out of years. You're getting kind of old. You're going to run out of talent. You're, God hasn't gifted you that much. Fear will drive you there. But if we let ourselves have more airtime with the good news, we start realizing that God has brought us into a thing and that same God who's worked miracles to get us there, he's going to provide in that place. He has resources. God has good things for you too. God has good stuff. And then the fear report keeps going. They've overemphasized fear. They've adopted the scarcity mentality. And then there's some good news that's brought up. Verse 31, Caleb says, Hey, let's go up and occupy it, for we will be able to overcome it. There's some good news. What does fear do right after that? Fear responds real quick. We are not able to go up against this people. So the, so the good news tried to get a little, get a little air time. Some, some good news tried to come into your brain and fear just right away just silenced it. Nope. You think we're able? We're not. Fear will silence all the good news. It's not that there's no good in your life. It's just that fear is talking so loud it doesn't want you to hear the good. So as soon as the faith report pipes up and says, hey, there's good stuff going on. This friend in your life, that's a, that's a thing God put in your life for good. These relationships, this church, this whatever it is, fear says, yeah, right, you know, you can't do this. It silences the good in your life. And the fear report keeps going and it forgets, that, I don't have a verse for this one because they didn't include a verse for this one. Fear forgets about God. Notice, read the whole report. Never once do they mention God in the report. God isn't mentioned until Caleb and Joshua speak up in, in verse 7 of chapter 14 and they start talking about God. But the whole fear report, they never once mention God. You know what that tells you? That means that fear looked at all that bad and said, you're going to have to have the strength to do that. When you walk into that land and there's giants, somehow you're going to have to be the one that defeats those giants. I mean, did they forget about the plagues? That wasn't Moses doing that. Did they forget about the Red Sea and Sinai? Like everything they had experienced up to that point, that was all God. And then somehow in fear, they're looking at the future and they're saying, I'm not strong enough. Man, I wish there was a God who could help, but he's not here. Fear forgets God. And I, I think you're, you're able to relate. Maybe you're looking at the future and you're saying, there's no way I can do this. And fear is good at telling you that you're not good enough. But it fails to remind you that God is and that he's there and he's present. And so when we listen to fear, we forget that that future we're called into is full of miracles, the power of a God who's led us to that point. And the report continues and we see that fear assumes the worst of us and it projects that onto others. In verse 33 it says, We seem to ourselves as grasshoppers and the same to them. So fear will, you know, there's, there's inadequacies, inadequacies in us. There's weaknesses in us. Fear will take those and say, you are nothing. You are tiny. Not only are you nothing, everyone else knows it. So those are the things that happen when you give fear more airtime than faith. What does that mean you should do? Um, on a practical note, you might need to unfriend, unfollow, or unsubscribe to some things. You might need to choose some voices that are speaking into your life that you're not going to let speak into your life anymore. Because you only have so much attention, and if you give enough of it to the fear report, those things are going to happen and you're going to be crippled. And the tragedy is that you're not then going to move into the good things that God has for your future. So think about the input that comes into your life. And just give more airtime to the good news than the bad. Maybe you need to replace the show with some scripture on audio. Maybe you need to look up a good sermon. Maybe you need to call a friend who's full of hope and letting God lead in their life and ask them to tell you some good truth about God to keep you going. There's input and we can choose which comes in. And what we need to do right now, if we want to have courage to step into the good future, is we need to have more airtime for the good news than the bad news. And finally, action number three, regulate your emotions with truth. Regulate your emotions with truth. Remember, fear is an emotion. It's not fact. It's feeling. It's not absolute truth. 
There might be some truth in it, but fear is an emotion, and we should have emotions. So when I say regulate your emotions with truth, I don't mean don't have emotions, just be logical and reason through things. I mean experience your emotions, but let God's truth regulate those so you don't get all wound up and go off the path. And that's what happened. Chapter 14. It's just a de- it's a, an erosion of confidence. Their emotions are deteriorating until they launch into an irrational panic. This is what happens. They start crying. They cry all night. Verse 2, they grumble against Moses and Aaron. That's what we do. We get discontent. We start complaining about our leaders, right? And so they grumble against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, then, then fear starts saying crazy stuff. The whole assembly said, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert. Like, that's their conclusion. Rather than going into a beautiful promised land that we've been looking forward to for 400 years, I just wish we died in Egypt. That would have been so much better than God's blessings. Fear, when it's not regulated by truth, starts spiraling down and starts saying crazy stuff. And that's what it does to you. Like, there are crazy ideas popping into your mind this week because fear is allowed to mess up with your emotions and you're starting to think crazy thoughts. But truth can regulate our emotions. I'm so glad our church values truth. I will be a, an emotional wreck if I don't have truth. So truth regulates those emotions and then watch, watch how they just spiral out of control emotionally. Not only we should have died in the desert, it says in verse 3, why is the Lord bringing us into the land to kill us by the sword? All right, unchecked fear will lead you to question God. And it's not wrong to question God, but when you question Him, hang around for His answer because they ask the right question. They ask the question in verse 3, why is the Lord bringing us into the land? That was the perfect question to ask. It was, because the answer to that question is, there's so much good in the future you're afraid of. I have a promise for you. If they would have honestly come to God and said, now remind us your purpose here. Why are you bringing us into the land? God would have showed them that he has so much good for them in this promised land. This is something I want for you. They would have had courage. But instead of waiting around for God's answer, like, it's kind of like when we say, God, what are you doing? As if you're not doing good things. Oh, if we just let him answer that question, <laughs> he'd tell us what he's doing. But instead of waiting around for his answer, they supply their own answer and they say, do you bring us out here to die by the sword? Like, you probably didn't bring us out here to walk into the promise. You probably just brought us out here so we'd die. So they start questioning God. And then verse 4, unchecked fear will lead you, tempt you to abandon God's plan. In verse 4 it says, they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You hear what's happening? God led them out of bondage. Slavery. And he led them into a desert so he could lead them into a promise and freedom and joy and blessing. And because they didn't regulate their emotions with truth, fear just spiraled and spiraled to the point that they actually believed in that moment listening to their emotions, they actually believed that it was better back in bondage than in God's freedom said, we should appoint a leader who can lead us back to Egypt. It's not better in Egypt, it's better in Canaan. If you're feeling the heat of the desert, there is a better place, but it's not back there. And God does, Satan does that to us. Like, he's led you past something, and maybe he's whispered in your ear when fear comes and you spiral out of control, maybe he's saying, hey, you know, it was actually better back there before you started trying to follow Jesus. Before you started speaking that kind way to your family, before you tried to get free from your addiction, just go back to that because it was a lot easier back there in bondage. You know, everything was working until you decided, hey, I'm going to give tithe and I'm going to support God in all my life. It was a whole lot easier and safer back there in bondage. And what God's going to, what the devil's going to do, what fear does, is he's going to point back to slavery and somehow, I don't know how this he even gets away with this. He's going to convince us, if we're not regulating our emotions by truth, that somehow we were better off slaves to him than free in Jesus. 
Has the devil done that with your emotions? Like, have you let your emotions get so irregulated that somehow you're tempted to think, I should just turn back to that? There was comfort in that thing. There was security in that thing. Oh, it's such a lie. Like, their toes were on the edge of the promised land, and they're thinking there's, there's better stuff. So regulate your emotions with truth. That's what Caleb and Joshua try to do, beginning in verse 7. They speak some truth to the people. Spiraling, spiraling out of control in their emotions. And in verse 7, Caleb and Joshua say, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. There's so much good in the future you're afraid of. It's exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land that flows with milk and honey and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. They said, they devour us. He says, we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. So what just happened right now is there was a spiraling out of control of emotion, and then truth was injected. They said, hey, God is with us. The land is good. All these things. You know what that should have done? The people should have said, oh, thank you. Caleb and Joshua, we were getting way out of whack. We forgot all that things. You set us straight. God is good. We're going to walk into the promise. They didn't do that. They didn't let truth regulate their emotions. Verse 10, you know what it says? Instead of saying, thank you for setting us straight, it says, and then they all talked about stoning them. The rational thing to do would have been to say, oh, I listened to a lie. That's truth. But instead, they listened to the voice of fear and it led them to extremist behavior. They were literally thinking until the glory of God shows up in verse 10. They were thinking about picking up stones and throwing them at Caleb and Joshua, the the two best things they had going for them. Two people speaking truth and life. And they were going to engage in mob mentality extremism because they did not let truth regulate their emotion. You guys see that going on in our world? Like, we preach truth, and then someone says, kill them! Like, let's rebel against this stuff. Close your ears to this stuff. I don't want my fear regulated by truth. But we have the opportunity to regulate our emotions. When it starts telling you it's better off back in Egypt, God's plan is pretty sketchy, I don't know if you should follow him, we need truth to speak into our life. What you need to do is you need to open up the Bible and start reading. You need to talk to a friend and say, hey, remind me of truth. You need to start listening to a sermon. Something to start regulating your emotions with truth. Not logic, not reason, not, you know, five steps of self-help. Truth. We need truth in our life. And so those are three things that we can do. Three things they didn't do. Instead, they hung out in the wilderness for an extra 40 years. Fear wastes time, guys. God didn't send them back to Egypt, but he said, you want to stay here, you can stay here. They said, we want to die in Egypt, and God literally says, you will die in Egypt, or in the wilderness, not in Egypt. He says, you want to die here? Well, every single one who went into the land, the 40 days they're in there, I'll give you 40 years, and all of them will die here in the wilderness except Caleb and Joshua because they had a different spirit. They're going to go into the land and lead you there. So if you want to die in the wilderness, we have this God who's, who's so into freedom, so good, he'll give you what you want. You want to stay crippled in fear? He'll let you stay crippled in fear. And God leads those who are willing into the promised land. It's no coincidence that when God calls Joshua after the 40 years, and he's trying to remind them how to enter the promised land, he says to him, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed, for I'm with you. The message he had was, you can go into this promised land, but don't let fear cripple you again. So they stayed right there. 40 years, 40 extra years because of fear. The book of Deuteronomy wouldn't have had to be written if they didn't listen to fear. All that stuff between Numbers 13 and 14 all the way to Joshua, that was extra stuff that only happened because of fear. Just think about this. The book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers chapter 1 through 14, that was a year of their life. 
But the next seven chapters, that was 40 years. Fear wastes time. They were moving forward like boom, and fear wastes time. And here's the truth. Fear wants you to believe that you can get out of the future. I'm afraid of that future. I'm just going to hide. The future is inevitable. It's coming. Tomorrow's going to come no matter how afraid of it I am. The future's inevitable. You have two options. You move into the future or you die right now. I want to move into the future. The only way that I don't move into the future is if I stop living. So what I do to try to hide from that reality is I just go into denial. And I stop, stop realizing the future's coming. I stop dealing with it. I stop looking for the good in the future. And then I just get crippled in fear. But we don't have to do that. The reason the Israelites landed there is they did not listen to both sides of the story. They did not give more airtime to truth than bad news. And they did not regulate their emotions with fear. There was a good future for Nick Walinda too. So he was, in 2017, he was crippled in fear. He was seriously thinking about leaving it all. And then he wrestled through it. He had some PTSD. He realized for the first time he actually is affected by fear. He wrestled through that. And he wrote a book called Facing Our Fears. It was published in 2020. And the subtitle was, yeah, I'll read the subtitle. The, the subtitle, it goes along with the story. It says, stepping out in faith, step out in faith and rise above what's holding you back. So Nick Willinda realized, I need to step out in faith and rise above what's holding me back. You know what he did after that? The man who was crippled by fear, after that he continued to walk on the wire in fact, in March 2020, here's what Nick did. Okay. Nick Walinda, the man who overcame fear, he sets up a wire on one side of an active volcano and another. There's an active volcano, like there's lava and fire and smoke. He sets up a wire and he puts a gas mask on and walks through an active volcano the length of six football fields. Now, you might be thinking, uh, I don't want to walk into a future like that. But for Nick, that was his passion. Not only was it his passion, but it gave him a platform, a global platform, where he can speak courage into the lives of millions of people. Nick is a Christian. He's outspoken of his Christian faith. If you Google or YouTube him walking across the volcano, he's praying to Jesus the whole time, and millions of people saw that, and he now has a platform to speak courage into the lives of fearful people. There was so much good in the future Nick Walinda was afraid of. He could have stayed crippled in fear, and you know what he would have been? You'd Google him right now, and you'd hear former daredevil who did some amazing things, and now he, uh, you know, works here at a desk job. Instead, he's living a life of courage and passion and inspiring others. God has so much good in the future, and you might be at a place right now where you're saying, uh, I like your message, Pastor, but you don't understand, I'm actually at a place where there's no good in my future you might literally be at the end of life. Maybe literally your best days are behind you. You might be at the end of your marriage. You might be at the end of your career. And I'm not here just to come with a whole bunch of sunshine and optimism and and ignore that. Like you might be at a place where your future doesn't look as good as your past did. Here's the difference between this sermon and a non-Christian motivational speech. Motivational speech says, there's good, go for it. And this sermon says, uh, there might be some bad, but on the other side of chaos, there's an eternity of good. There is so much good in the future you're afraid of. It might not happen on this earth. It might. But I guarantee you, God has a heavenly Canaan. Our toes are on the edge of it. And if we will pursue and persist in fear rather than look back to Egypt and listen to the voice of fear, there is so much good in the future you're afraid of. And so I invite you, Uh, Step back on the wire and start walking because there's so much good in the future you're afraid of.